I want to start with a few questions. Do you feel as close to God as you would like? Do you, well, you don't have to answer. <laughs> Do you feel empowered by God in your struggle against certain sins or uh, in the struggle to gain certain Christ-like character? Or do you even care about Christ-like character of sin? Do you struggle with guilt or anxiety or with bitterness or unforgiveness at, at some hurt from some person? Do you struggle with discerning the will of God in your life? St. Theophon the Reckless, who was a 19th century uh, Russian bishop, not spider, uh, said this. He said, prayer is the test of everything. If prayer is right, everything is right. Now be careful. He's not saying that life will be hunky-dory if prayer is right. All you got to do is pray and everything will just get better magically. That's not what he's saying. But what he's saying is that true prayer, solid prayer, good prayer, makes things right within us, even if it doesn't necessarily make things right around us. And I've become convinced of something over the years of priestly ministry and, and my own personal uh, and family experience as well. And that's this. Discontentedness in life comes from defectiveness in prayer. Discontentedness in life comes from defectiveness in prayer. Defective in quality and in quantity. So I want to talk about that for the next several weeks. Do something a little bit different besides the you know comment on the lectionary readings, which often have no thematic unity from Sunday to Sunday. Because I think it's important. You know, we hear a lot about the need to unplug, right? How many of you have read something or seen a commercial telling you you need to unplug for a while? Unplug from your cell phone, unplug from your television, unplug from your email, unplug from your office. Unplug from your job, maybe even your family, who knows. But we need to unplug, right? Now that's good advice, but it's only part of the story, all right? Because to change the, the analogy a little bit, if you unplug something, it doesn't have any power. So, yeah, we need to unplug from things, because so many of the things that we're plugged into actually drain and deplete us. That's not how it's supposed to work. So we need to plug in to something that actually recharges us. So what I want to talk about in the next several weeks is plugging in to God. And how do we plug in to God? Well, the primary way that we plug into God is through prayer. It's through prayer. And I'm a priest, and I can tell you, my prayer life stinks. And this is my profession. So if that's the case for me, then I imagine it probably is the case for some of you as well. So let's talk and walk through this together. So today I want to talk about three things. You'll be thankful. Uh, pertaining to prayer. That just kind of lay a foundation for the rest of the series, okay? What is prayer? Why do we need to pray? And what is prayer worth? So the what, the why, and the worth. Okay, what's prayer? It seems obvious, doesn't it? Well, believe me, I've talked to a lot of people about what their opinion of prayer is, and it's not obvious at all. What is prayer? The Catechism of our church that was just recently adopted has what I think is one of the best definitions of prayer, and it says this. Prayer is turning my heart toward God to converse with Him in worship. Prayer is turning my heart toward God to converse with Him in worship. Heart, okay, is not talking about syrupy, emotional part of us, okay? Heart just means the very depth of our being, the inner core of our being, underneath all the superficiality, okay? Where we are, who we really are, that's our heart. And so prayer is turning my heart toward God to converse with Him in worship. It's a great definition because not only is it biblical, but it also agrees with what the fathers of the church have said throughout all the centuries. In the third century, St. Clement of Alexandria in Egypt said prayer is a conversation with God. And fast forward into the eighth century in Damascus, uh, St. John of Damascus said prayer is the raising of the mind to God 
and the asking of good things. Sorry, I don't get that. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like for me to explain it again? Jesus assumed his disciples would 
pray. He taught his disciples to pray. All kinds of places in Scripture that, that talk about prayer as if it is a thing to be done, uh, not something to be considered by those who are, you know, inclined to that sort of thing. Saint Paul wrote to the uh, wrote to Timothy. He said, "Therefore, first of all, I exhort that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all people, for kings and all who are in authority." That we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Exhort first of all that prayers and supplications be made. In 1 Thessalonians, he said, pray without ceasing. Hmm. A lot of us pray without starting. <laughs> How are we supposed to pray without ceasing? Luke, in uh, chapter 18, writes, Then Jesus spoke a parable to them, the disciples, that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. And finally, in Colossians, Paul writes, continue earnestly in prayer. Continue earnestly in prayer. Ongoing activity. And on top of all of that is just the example of the apostles, the prophets. Jesus himself spent a lot of time in prayer to read the Gospels. If those folks need to pray, how much more so do we need prayer in our life? So, okay, God commands us to pray. That's reason one. Reason two is because we want to know God and we want to be known by God. The Christian life is basically a life of union with God in Christ. We were once unreconciled to God, estranged from Him. In Christ, we are reconciled to Him. We're in union with Him. That's really, that's what Christianity is. And so, Christian life is that life of union with God. It's the life of children with their Heavenly Father. It's the life of disciples, students really, with their master and teacher. It's the life of temp temples or receptacles of the Holy Spirit, which we are. It's the life of bride, the church, with her bridegroom, Jesus Christ. So Christianity is fundamentally relational, all right? And relationships grow with communication, with time spent together in a regular and intentional way. Relationships are not built in a haphazard, ad hoc kind of way. And if it's true in marriage, if it's true with children, if it's true with friendships, it's even more true with God. So we, we desire to know God and be known by Him, and this happens through prayer. Third, we pray because we need God's grace and power in our lives. How many of you remember that rapper MC Hammer? Okay, anybody remember MC Hammer? All right, now most of you probably remember a song, Can't Touch This. It still manages to make its way into movies and uh, radio at times. Well, he wrote another song, too, and uh, it had that phrase, you got to pray just to make it today. All right? You got to pray just to make it today. We pray because we need God's grace and power. And like Bishop Frank Wilson told us, prayer is the means by which that power is released. The power that's really already there. Now, I'm not talking about new agey, spark of the divine within you, if you just unlock the power type business. I'm talking about the Holy Spirit, which is in every believer through baptism. When we are baptized, we come up out of the water with new life in Christ, and we get that chrism oil on our foreheads, sealing with the Holy Spirit. So we've got the Holy Spirit within us, but it is prayer which unlocks and releases that power that's within us. In John chapter 15, Jesus compared himself and his followers with a vine and with branches. Now branches don't have a life on their own. If you've ever done any pruning or, or tree trimming in your house, you have these beautiful branches that are just too long, so you cut them off your tree. And what happens to them? They die. They get ugly. They dry up. Okay? Because they don't have a life of their own. Their life is dependent upon being connected to the tree. And that's what Jesus is getting at. Of course, he's not using a tree. He's using like a grapevine. The branches have no life of their own. They take their life from their connection to the vine. And Jesus says, so it is with me. Apart from me, you can do nothing. How do we stay in the vine? Prayer. One of the most important ways to do that. The Christian life is just too hard. It's too challenging to do it right without prayer. Now, why do I say to do it right? Because oftentimes the temptation is to make the Christian life easier rather than raise ourselves to the bar. 
It's just too difficult. Why is it too difficult? Well, it must be wrong. Let's cut out some of the things that we don't like. It's too hard. No, it's difficult because for the most part, we try to do it in our own strength. It's a pull yourself up by the bootstraps mentality. And when it comes to the Christian life and sin and things like that, failure is not an option. It's inevitable. And we need the grace of God for that. The old Anglican Catechism, which was in every prayer book from 1549 all the way to 1928, had this to say. My good child, know this, that thou art not able to do these things of thyself, nor to walk in the commandments of God, nor to serve Him without His special grace, which thou must learn at all times to call for by diligent prayer. Prayer is the way to get the grace that we need. Our souls need prayer in the same way that our lungs need air. It's the same thing. Prayer is to the spiritual life what breathing is to the physical life. And not praying does to the soul what not breathing does to the body. And we don't need much medical knowledge to know what happens there, do we? Finally, we pray because God responds to the prayers of His people. It's conversation. It's dynamic. Okay? God responds to the prayers of His people. Psalm 65, verse 2. The psalmist prays, O thou that hearest prayer, to thee all flesh shall come. And in 116, the psalmist says, My delight is in the Lord, for he hath heard the voice of my prayers. And Jesus himself, in Matthew 7, says, If you then, being evil, relatively speaking, Know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask Him? So God responds to the prayers of His people. So we pray because God told us to. We pray because we want to know God. We pray because we need God's grace. And we pray because God answers and responds. Alright, those are a few of the whys of prayer. Now, here's your big question. The ROI question. Return on investment. What's in it for me? Now normally that's a bad question, okay? Especially with spiritual things. We've got far too many questions that have to do with, you know, what's in it for me, 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 what do I get out of it? I understand that. So normally it's a bad question, but it's entirely understandable in this case, and maybe even biblical. Psalm 103 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. So what are the benefits of prayer? Well, first, and these are in no particular order, closeness to God. I'll pray, I'll pray when I start feeling close to God. Mm -hmm. It's like, I'll, I'll, uh, you know, I'll hang out with my children once I feel closer to them. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense, right? <clears throat> No, closeness to God is the fruit of prayer, not the root of it. It's the fruit of prayer. In James chapter 4, the apostle writes, Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Draw near to God, and then what do I have to do to get God close to me? Nothing. You just draw near to him. Alright? We take one step towards God, and we find he's already taking ten steps towards us. Or better yet, we walk away from God. No matter how far we go, we turn around, and there He is. He's following us and pursuing us the whole time. So draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. Closeness to God is a fruit of prayer. Joy. Now, as good Americans, hopefully we're all, you know, well on our way in our rightful constitutional pursuit of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But if you're, you know, normal, then... Life and liberty has happened pretty well. Happiness is a little more elusive, right? What's happiness in the first place? Well, I don't know. But joy is something that transcends happiness. Joy is something in which we can abide. And joy comes from being in the presence of God. Psalm 16, verse 11 says, In your presence there is fullness of joy. And in your right hand are pleasures forevermore. 
So closeness to God, that brings us joy, and that joy brings us peace. How many of us would like more peace in our lives? I mean, uh, you are so fortunate if you could honestly say to me, Father, I just have way too much peace in my life. <laughs> I got peace like eight rivers. Okay? Peace. We need peace. We want peace. And a lot of times the reason we don't have peace is because we want that peace to come from somewhere it's not going to come. Paul writes in Philippians 4, Be anxious for nothing, yeah, Paul, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Okay? Did those words sound familiar? We say them, you know, after the, the blessing. What have we just done at that blessing? We pray. Okay? The blessing did not magically shoot peace out to everybody. It's just an expression of the fact that we are in the peace of God because we've been in the presence of God. And that's how peace, or how prayer, produces peace. Prayer does not produce peace by magically rearranging the chess pieces on the board in our favor. Prayer produces peace by making it more dependent on the presence of God in the heart than in the absence of trials in the life. I'll say that again in prayer. Peace becomes more dependent on the presence of God in the heart than on the absence of trials in life. That's why the peace passes understanding. Does it really pass all understanding to know why somebody's peaceful if their life is grand? I mean, that's not hard to understand. Nobody has any problems. Everything's going right. Uh, oh, I just wonder why they have so much peace. I don't wonder. Nothing's wrong. That's why they have peace. What I wonder is, how do people whose lives are crumbling around them have peace? That passes understanding. And that's what Paul's talking about uh, in that verse. So we have closeness to God, joy, peace, guidance. Oh, I just don't know what God wants me to do. Psalm 32, verse 8. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. I will instruct you. Not, I may instruct you. If you're nice. If you're good. If you tithe. Notice everybody got uncomfortable with that. <laughs> Strength and temptation. Oh, I just wish I could stay away from that particular sin, that particular temptation. Prayer, uh, prayer strengthens us because whenever we draw close to God, we're drawing further away from sin. Either prayer will keep us from sin, or sin will keep us from prayer. And finally, the Holy Spirit Himself. God gives us Himself as the greatest gift of prayer. Not just like, you know, a little piece here and there, but he gives us the gift of himself, okay? The Holy Spirit, the third person of the Holy Trinity. All right, God, the Father in heaven, Jesus at the right hand of the Father in heaven, the Holy Spirit is, is in the church, okay? Which is the temple of the Holy Spirit, and the members <coughs> of the church. The Holy Spirit is within our hearts, and we experience that Holy Spirit and the power that He gives us, and the grace He gives us, and the provisions for our needs through prayer. Luke chapter 11, Jesus said, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened. For everyone who asks, receives. He who seeks, finds. He who knocks, it will be opened. And here's the kicker. If a, if a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a snake instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a serpent or a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? So what is prayer? It's the lifting up of our mind and heart to God to converse with Him. Why do we pray? Well, because... God loves us and wants us to pray, and God is the Lord and He commands us to pray. And we need to pray. And what's in it for us? Well, nothing less than God Himself. He's made prayer to be the means whereby we take hold of Him and all the gifts that He gives us. So then what's next? Well, I want to ask you to do three things uh, this week. 
Look back, look now, look ahead. Look back. Who taught you how to pray as a kid? Did anybody teach you how to pray as a kid? Uh, were you taught about prayer, or were you actually taught to pray? Did you have a few memorized prayers? God is great, God is good, so on and so forth. Uh, or, or did you learn something else? Did, um, and leading up to now, what's your prayer like now? Do you pray as if you think about God on occasion? Or do you pray seldomly? Do you pray frequently? Do you ever pray? Do you pray all the time? You know, so it's not a right or wrong answer kind of thing. And finally, look ahead. If you had your druthers, what would your you know, relationship with God look like? And we're not talking about monasteries or uh, you know, going nuts or anything like that. But we're just saying, you know, are you satisfied with your spiritual life? With your level of, of closeness to God? I'm reminded of a scene from the movie War Room, which I have not seen in its entirety, but I saw a clip of it um, on the source of all wisdom and knowledge, YouTube. And, uh, <laughs> the, the clip is a scene where two of the main actors, one, an elderly widow uh, looking to sell her house, the other, um, a very uh, beautiful, successful realtor with a you know perfect life, beautiful house, married to a successful husband, they have a child. Anyway, so they're they're sitting down in the kitchen and they're the realtor wants to talk about selling the house. Uh, Miss Clara, the widow, wants to talk about church and prayer and how is that going in your life. And the realtor's not too happy with it. She's very uncomfortable with the whole thing. She keeps trying to steer the direction away. It comes up with the usual, well I believe in God and I'm a good person and I go to church on occasion. And she asks, was well, that because your pastor only preaches occasionally? <laughs> well, then, finally the conversation winds up, and Miss Claire goes into the kitchen and gets some coffee for the, two, um, for the two women. And she brings it back in, and she hands her cup to the realtor, who takes a sip, grimaces, and says, Miss Claire, do you like your coffee lukewarm? And Miss Clara just kind of takes a sip and says, baby, mine is hot. And that was a parable, really. It was to set up what the movie was all about. Miss Clara was a very prayerful, believing woman. She was a simple woman, but she was tremendously powerful in Christ. Why? Because she was so clever and brilliant? Well, I don't know. It's just a movie, by the way. But she was wise and powerful in the way of prayer. So if prayer is coffee, is your coffee cold? Is it lukewarm? Is it hot? But most importantly, are you satisfied with it? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Amen.